Okay, so uh, I'm Hussein. Uh, I'll be talking about universal adversarial perturbations today. This is joint work with Said Moussa Fauzi and Pascal Fossard. So in the, re in the recent years, there has been huge um, uh, improvement in the classification accuracy uh, on very complex uh, data sets, uh, such as ImageNet, including like um, thousands of labels and, and millions of images. Uh, in particular, um, uh, deep neural networks, deep convolution neural networks are now able to actually uh, achieve uh, performance that is on par with uh, what a trained human would, would do on such very complex data sets like ImageNet. Okay. Despite this uh, huge improvement in the, in the classification accuracy that we have, if we are to deploy these classifiers in real world environments, uh, in many cases, we actually need also to satisfy some robustness constraints, okay? So what do I mean here by robustness? Well, it's actually something very simple. If I have, let's say, an image of a lampshade that is correctly recognized by, the image, uh, by, the deep, by, my, by my deep network as a lampshade, and I perturb my, my image just a little bit here, and then I input this to my classifier, I want the output of my classifier to be also uh, a lampshade, okay? So depending on the application, uh, one might be interested in different kinds of perturbations. So for example, uh, one might be interested in achieving robustness to adversarial perturbations. So in this kind of perturbation regime, there is a malicious agent that tries to basically add the minimum amount of perturbation in order to cause uh, the, um, the, the classifier to completely misclassify on this image. Okay? Another kind of perturbation is that of random noise, for example. Um, or on more computer vision applications, we might be interested in achieving robustness to structured noise instances. Okay? But uh, what I'd like to focus on today is something uh, different. It's a perturbation regime that is very simple, uh, albeit I believe fundamental. Uh, so the question that I'll be asking is the following Does there exist a single perturbation, so one image, in such a way that I add this perturbation to any natural image or to most natural images and it causes the classifier to misclassify? on most natural images, okay? So I'm trying to, to in other words, uh, if I represent this uh, in, a, in a diagram fashion, I'm trying to see whether there exists this perturbation represented in the center of the slide here, in such a way that I add this perturbation to the image, let's say, of a joystick, which is correctly recognized as a joystick, okay? And the perturbed image that I get is visually very similar to the original image, yet it is actually misclassified here as a shiwa. Now, if I add the same perturbation, uh, to this image of a flagpole, again, the, 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 uh, the classifier becomes misclassified, okay? Uh, misclassifies the image, okay? So uh, if I add this perturbation to the image of a balloon, again, I, I get something different from a balloon. So I'm trying to, 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 uh, to, uh, to understand whether there exists a single perturbation such that uh, I can fool uh, my uh, classifier on most natural images, okay? So note that this is, this is uh, different, for example, from uh, adversarial perturbations, where uh, in adversarial perturbations we try to craft um, um, like perturbations specifically for this image to fool the classifier on this specific image. Here, the, the, the perturbation that I'm trying to find is actually image agnostic. Okay. Uh, so as surprising as this might sound, yes, we can actually find a, such a perturbation and uh, universal perturbation that uh, causes most, um, um, that causes state-of-the-art deep neural networks to misclassify on most natural images. Okay, so first let's try to see how can we actually compute such perturbations. So let's assume that we have a bunch of training, training images, x1 to xm, okay? Uh, so here are three in this uh, uh, schematic example, okay? And each uh, image is basically represented, can be represented as a, as a point in the pixel space, okay? Um, like in the, uh, here, it's, it's just 2D for, for, uh, for simplicity, okay? Now, I, uh, around each data point, I actually show the classification region associated to it. So if I take here any point in this classification region, I'm classified in the same way as the red dot here. And if I take here any point uh, in this classification region, I'm classified in the same way as this blue point here, okay? So uh, just for simplicity, now I'm going to basically uh, 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 consider that, uh, I mean, uh, put all these classification regions on top of each other so that the data points are actually on, on top of each other. And um, 
uh, the, the, the goal of finding a universal perturbation now becomes that of finding a perturbation that goes outside of the union of all these regions. Okay, so what, how do we do? It's actually pretty simple. We start by the first point, okay, and then we try to find the perturbation that goes outside of the first point. Okay, um, as you can see, this perturbation does fool the first data point, but not the two others. So what I need to do is actually to add the increment, the perturbation increment, in such a way to fool also the second data point. Okay, so this is exactly what I'm doing. But as you can see, the sum of these two perturbations now they fool the, the, the first two points, but not the third uh, data point. So I, I do this iteratively till I get basically a perturbation that goes outside of the three classification regions. Okay. Now, of course, I need to also make sure that the, that the universal perturbation that I find is sufficiently small. So what I do is actually that I project uh, at each step on the LP ball of, uh, of user-specified radius in order to make sure that this is sufficiently small. Okay? Okay, so let's try to see now how this algorithm works. Um, so in order to do this, we actually tried it on um, like 10, a subset of 10,000 training images taken from ImageNet. And then we, we constrain the perturbation to be one order of magnitude smaller than the norm of images. Okay? And then we evaluate the perturbation that we get on a validation set, so basically on images that are not in X. Okay? Uh, so this is basically the, the perturbations that we get here. They are very structured perturbations. But more importantly, the fooling rates here show that actually we can fool most images in the, set, in the validation set with these perturbations. So these, uh, per these images were never seen by the classifier before. Um, so yeah, as you can see, the, the rates that we can get are actually pretty high. OK, so um, um, now actually, what does this visually correspond to? So this is, for example, an image of uh, a Christmas stocking that was originally classified as a Christmas stocking by the DPR network, yet now that we added this universal perturbation, it became, became an Indian elephant. Okay? So this is a perturbed image. Okay? And this is another perturbed image. This was uh, originally classified as, a, as wool, but now it's misclassified. Uh, sorry, it's, it was classified as a, a Bouvier de Flandre, I think, which is a type of dog, and then it's classified as a wool. Okay? And these are all images that are on which we added this single universal perturbation in order to cause, basically, the classifier to misclassify. This is a mix of images that I've taken myself as well as images from the validation set. Okay? OK, so now that we understand how can we actually compute universal perturbations, and now that we understand that we know what is the effect of these universal perturbations on the data, um, let's study some of the properties of these universal perturbations. One of the fundamental properties of these is that actually they do generalize well across different uh, neural networks. So for example, if I compute a universal perturbation for a specific network, and then I try it on another network, it's actually, again, going to fool most of the images on the other network. Okay. Um, now, unfortunately, if we do data augmentation uh, uh, by generating basically these universal perturbation and training based on these perturbed images, we do not get an improvement of the, of the robustness at all, or a very slight improvement. And the reason behind this is that the universal perturbations are extremely diverse. So there is no such thing called one universal perturbation that would basically, if you are robust to this direction in the input space, then you, you, you are basically, uh, you, you, you solve the problem. No, there is a tons of these, OK? Um, and uh, I mean, despite the diversity of actually these universal perturbations, it's, it's important to highlight here that um, these represent very specific directions in the input space. Okay, so they're not just random directions or something like this. They represent something very specific about the deep neural network that we yet have to understand. Um, so, for in order to to to, um, to verify this, actually, um, if we try to uh, to to, um, to craft a perturbation, a, ran a random noise that would have the same properties as the universal perturbation, we would need a random noise that is ten times larger than that of, than that of universal perturbations. So this shows that these universe, that these uh, directions represent something very specific about the deep network uh, to which the network is actually vulnerable. Okay. OK, so um, how can we actually, uh, I mean, in order to understand uh, what, what do these directions represent, okay, uh, we need to take a step back and try to actually study more the, the geometry of the decision boundary of these deep neural networks. Um, 
unfortunately, I do not have much time to actually uh, like go in detail in this. I'd be happy to talk with you on, in the poster. Um, but actually, what we can show is that there exists an intimate relation between um, the, the, the existence of universal perturbations and the geometric correlations between um, different parts of the decision boundary. Namely, if I look at the decision boundary in the vicinity of, uh, of, of a natural image and the vicinity of na another natural image, there is actually a lot of things in common. So more, more specifically, if we actually uh, um, uh, summarize the geometry of the decision boundary by the normals, by the normals to, the, to, to the decision boundary in the vicinity of natural images, we can show that these, um, that these normals to the decision boundary are actually extremely correlated in the sense that they lie in a low dimensional um, subspace. Okay? Um, I'd be very happy to discuss this with you more in the poster. There, are, there is a, 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 a more to the story. Okay, so in conclusion, um, um, one of the main points of this talk was actually to, um, to show that there exists universal perturbations, image agnostic perturbations that cause the, the deep neural network to fail on most natural images. Um, <clears throat> that, these, uh, that these universal perturbations have some uh, in, uh, important properties, like for example, they do generalize well across different neural networks. Uh, unfortunately, feedbacking does not improve the robustness to perturbations, and um, also the fact that these universal perturbations are very much related to the geometry of the decision boundary of these deep neural networks. The code is available online for this uh, paper, um, so thank you very much.